I'm thinking this is going to be a good week for Penn State recruiting. You are Locked On Nittany Lions, your daily podcast on the Penn State Nittany Lions, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, that is right. You are locked on Nittany Lines. Thanks so much for making us your first listen and watch every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. My name is Zach Seiko. I am your host of the show, and we bring him back from the Locked On Podcast Network. That is Brian Smith, our recruiting expert here, part of the network, also publisher for Fan Nation, All Hurricanes. Brian, we're uh, color coordinated today, but the everydayers (laughs) love you, and that's why we bring you back on the show. Thank you very much. How are you doing, sir? I'm, I'm doing great because this could be a great week for Penn State recruiting. A, a great finish to the month. Uh, there are some other important things, some updates we need to get to about other prospects. Jalen Harvey uncommitted, but there is some good news there. Ty Zier, Denmark committed, but something it, it's not a subject that I want to talk about, but it's something that does need to be brought up. But let's start with the good news because it seems like all the signs are pointing to Liam Andrews and T.A. Cunningham committing back-to-back days to the Penn State Nittany Lions. Uh, Deion Barnes has gone crazy in the month of July here. Like I said, wide receiver, that was the month month of June, was going to be Marcus Haggins making that impression for the wide receivers. And now Deion Barnes really settling in as this full-time position coach for the defensive line. Liam Andrews made it very clear. All these other recruiting sites, they have him listed as an offensive lineman. He says, "Uh uh-uh. No more. I'm a defensive lineman. You need to change me. That's where I'm starting first. And then T.A. Cunningham, also a defensive tackle that uh, both of them are projected. And it sounds like there's a lot of confidence that they are going to land with the Nittany Lions at the end of this week. Yeah, I know T.A. pretty well. I don't know Liam, but uh, T.A. has been on the scene since he was a freshman in high school. He was already going to the Under Armour events and stuff. Mm -hmm. He's got like 50, 60 offers. Uh, Plays now at Miami Central. He has a high upside. He's a kid that'll probably need a year just like everybody else down in the trenches, but his upside is there and he he could be an NFL player one day. Liam's case is is more interesting because like you said, most people thought he was going to be an offensive lineman. South Carolina, Penn State and some other schools decided to give him a chance at D-line. I'm curious to see how that works out because I know he can play O-line. D-line's just harder. So let's see what he can do, but he's a big bodied athlete that has long levers. Why not? Let's see what he can ha- let's see what he can do at Happy Valley. And T.A. Cunningham, let's visit his player profile first, and then Liam Andrews, because this is something that we actually talked about in depth. It was a very popular episode. A lot of people watched it, listened to it to get a full understanding of Liam Andrews. So I don't want to neglect him, but we already have done our due diligence as far as what his background is. For T.A. Cunningham, he's had quite the roller coaster of a career. Uh, started out West Coast was arguably one of the top 10 players in the nation when it came to high school football recruiting, at least projecting early on for the class of 2024. Then he's moved around. He's transferred a few other high schools. He's settled in now, as you mentioned, Miami Central. Again, you're scouting a lot down in the state of Florida. So you know T.A. Cunningham better than most prospects. But nevertheless, Cunningham... He struggled to find his footing, at least in these newer destinations, but it still hasn't scared a lot of Division I programs off, including Penn State, because even though he's fallen a little bit from grace here, he was, again, a top 10 prospect, hypothetically, uh, once upon a time, and now has kind of settled into more of that four-star range. For for T.A. Cunningham, is that a sign of concern because other programs, it, it has been, but Penn State still believes in his potential. Is this someone that could ultimately live up to where he was once projected? Absolutely. I know Cunningham well, and he's a very level-headed kid, uh, very mature for his age, and he's always been that way. I've known him since he was a freshman in high school. He was originally in the Atlanta area, moved out to Los Alamitos, and then came down to Miami Central. I don't really worry about that stuff too much. I worry more about the person himself and he's not your typical kid that's going to be very immature when he goes off to college. So he'll adapt fine and he'll take coaching fine. And to that point, you don't transfer to Miami central, the team that just won the national title, unless you're pretty confident in your abilities. I mean, he may not even start like their D line has literally got more than four guys that are power five, literally it's insane. So they just rotate guys in and out. It's not going to matter, but that makes it better for him. He's going against top competition. So he wants it. He'll get better. And he's a good kid off the field too. I told him I'd talk to him after he committed and do an interview with him. Um, I'm kind of curious to see why 
he's going to pick school A or B or whatever it is because he's, like you said, his recruitment, it has been all over the map. So mm. I'm curious to see how it comes to a close. Yeah, and, and he's done his due diligence. He's visited tons of schools, and this is actually very impressive for Penn State because T.A. Cunningham did maximize – his visits the NCAA changing its rules as far as how many visits you can have. Sure. And I think Cunningham definitely capitalized on it, took advantage of it. And Penn, so it wasn't okay. There's in the case of Leah Andrews, it really came down to South Carolina, Wisconsin, and Penn state. But you, you look at the list of what, uh, where Cunningham has visited. You look recently uh, or not at least in the case of 2023, but beforehand, Oklahoma, Texas, Michigan, Washington. I mean, these were some tough schools that Penn State had to go up against to ultimately now it, it's not set in stone. Anything can happen in this case. Some reports have surfaced. Some rumors have leaked that uh, people have gotten the impression that T.A. Cunningham is all but a sure bet to go to Penn State. But there was some stiff competition to uh, to get him to come to Penn State all to begin with. Yeah, that's that's a long process. And I've been around mm -hmm. recruiting for probably about as long as you've been alive. And there's not many kids that have had a recruitment quite like his because mm -hmm. he was getting numerous SEC offers when he was a freshman in high school. Yep. That's just not common, man. It's just not. So he's kind of taken the mark of let's go see these places. Let's make sure. Let's build relationships. Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, you name it. He's gotten an offer. So now the question is, what is he really looking for? And that's what I'm kind of curious to ask him when I talk to him again. Because Penn State, I mean, I, I don't remember talking to him about Penn State a year ago. Yeah. And now all of a sudden they, they emerge. And again, until it's official, it's not official. But mm -hmm. it sure seems like that's where he's going to go. I'm curious what it is that Penn State sold him on. And as far as why Penn State wanted him, I'm telling you, you can't teach his height and length and his athleticism. He, yeah. he is uh, off a poster, what you want. Let's go back to that, right? This is something we brought up with Liam Andrews. So we raved about his potential. If he's going to be on the defensive line, offensive line, different case, but a defensive tackle, I think the same can be said for T.A. Cunningham. At six foot six, he could potentially get bigger, <laughs> could maybe be six foot seven when all's said and done, uh, if he's able to add a little bit of extra height. But in terms of weight, currently he's listed 275, 280 pounds. Yeah. Like Liam Andrews, this is someone I do believe with the openings at defensive tackle in just a year's time because of who's going to be moving on. You're going to lose a lot of veterans. You have some already unproven players that are younger on the roster. However, it's still a wide open room for players like Cunningham and Andrews to go in and say, hey, let's burn the red shirt. Let's enroll early. And we could be playing as, as backups right away. Yeah, I think playing time will play into any kid's decision whether they mm -hmm. want to admit it or not. But Cunningham, he's not going to be afraid of competition. I can assure you of that. Now, maybe he does red shirt because it's for the you know, best of him and Penn State, but mm -hmm. he'll come in and he'll compete early. And he's been a kid that was 260, 265 since he was a freshman in high school, and he's just gotten stronger and faster. I think he'll be a three-tech at some point, but he can play some five-tech too. Penn State will be able to play some games with him and move him around. Yeah. Anytime you can get guys like that, man, it makes your program better. And he's a versatile kid. So, yeah, I'm curious to see what he does. All the potential in the world, like I said, a former top 10 prospect once upon a time when the early projections for the class of 2024 were released. Somebody that necessarily wasn't under the radar, but didn't <laughs> didn't quite have the journey as Cunningham did. And that is Andrews and Brian, somebody that the everydayers know. We did have an episode of a long segment devoted to what Liam Andrews could bring. I still stand by the fact that he is someone like Cunningham that could come in, play right away if all things align properly. There's just a lot of space. There's there's a lot of open space for these two to come in and say, hey, let's enroll early and let's play early. Uh, so for Penn State, the, I think the recruiting battle was won here uh, because Liam Andrews wanted to play defensive tackle. And I get the impression that a lot of schools viewed him as an offensive lineman, but Penn State sees something different. Everybody has their own view. You know, one man's trash is another man's gold. Uh, this is a kid that's a really great athlete that has upside. Absolutely. And it depends on what you want to do in terms of your scheme, too. Are you going to be a multiple 3-3-5 three, three, and a 4-3? Or are you going to run some pure 3-4? What, what are you going to do? Uh, 
I don't know what's best for him, but if he is that devoted to playing it, hats off to Penn State for giving him that shot. If it doesn't work out and they say move to O-line and, and then he says, I don't want to, he's probably not going to be there. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like you got to give the kid a chance, but you got to earn it too. It's Penn State for crying out loud. So he's a big body kid. Again, like T.A., long arms. He's quick. He can break down and change direction. He can do those things. Now can he learn the nuances of hand placement and all that stuff? And that's just college football. You got to see who's who's up to snuff. Both are in the rivals top 250. That's really important. So you're getting not only guys that fit a need, but quality players that fit a need for Penn State. And just looking at the defensive line commits that are already there, Xavier Gilliam, who we're going to talk about a little bit in this upcoming segment, along with Jalen Harvey, because there's a little bit of a connection for their final high school season. DeAndre Cook, both of those guys are projected to move inside at defensive tackle. Malachi Williams, a true defensive end as well. And then Jalen Harvey, like we said, he is an edge, but we'll talk about more of his player profile in just a moment. So Penn State really loading up on defensive tackle. Folks, if you don't think that James Franklin and this Penn State staff understand where they need to target and what they need to build up, a lot of complaints went at the interior of the defensive line just a season ago because Michigan ran the football very effectively. I still stand what I know watching that game. The linebackers didn't do that well, and frankly, the defensive scheme wasn't that great on that given day. The defensive tackles, they were double teamed. They could only do so much, but Penn State really answering the call and beefing up in the interior on both sides of the football, offensively and defensively. It is locked on Nittany Lions. Before we get to Jalen Harvey and some news surrounding Tizier Denmark, more recruiting news for Penn State football, let's hear from our sponsor of today's episode, and that is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Take your swing at betting Major League Baseball on FanDuel and get 10 times. That's 10 times, folks, your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks and you will land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's $200 you can spend betting everything from the money line, the over under, who you think is going to even hit the first home run, all in an app that's safe secure, super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you get paid instantly. That's honestly the best feature they have to offer. There's no better place to bet on Major League Baseball than FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on and get up to $200 in bonus bets. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Check out happyvalleyinsider.com for all the latest Penn State football, basketball, Penn State recruiting news. Happyvalleyinsider.com, Penn State Rivals, and Locked on Nittany Lions is your go-to podcast for Penn State Rivals. And Brian, where can people keep up with what all the incredible work that you do for both the Locked on Podcast Network and, of course, all Hurricanes? At FB Scout underscore Florida, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on YouTube, um, a lot of things have been going on with recruiting and now yeah. even getting into a little bit of the preseason stuff. We're almost there. We're almost there, almost. but uh, all the big 10 media days and all that stuff's fun too. So in a couple of weeks we'll have practice and it gets really interesting. Yeah. And for Penn state, they have to go up against the likes of Miami. And I know I, I've seen keeping just a little bit of tabs on what the hurricanes are doing as far as recruiting, because Penn state has mutual prospects that, but that's, yes, that's the, the everydayers know this because we brought this up quite a bit. And something that you've noticed is that Penn state with its expanded staff, they've been recruiting all over the place. It wasn't just for dominate the state. That's the most important part, but then they used, okay, Maryland, Virginia, the DMV area, but now it's consistently Florida, Texas. And once upon a time, Penn State really wasn't recruiting those areas. Not only were they not really recruiting them, they weren't doing it well. And, and that's the difference. You can recruit all those areas all you want, but if you don't have good success, you don't have a good track record, then then what's even the point of wasting your time? Someone that is in the Maryland area, Jalen Harvey, that is someone that Penn State has been targeting for quite some time. Very impressive prospect. This is somebody, if you know the Penn State big board, and this is something we've shared on Locked on Nittany Lions, Liam Andrews and Malachi Williams were the top priorities. I would say a a 2A, 2B at this point. Overall, Jalen Harvey is not far down the list. This is not someone that Penn State is settling for. 
I, but his recruitment became a little bit interesting when USC got involved. When Florida got involved, it sounded like Maryland was pulling out all the stops when it came to NIL. And Penn State, the good news as of late, has been able to fend that off. But Jalen Harvey, it, it seems like everybody's had a future cast, a crystal ball, a projection in for him since 2021, honestly, it, it, not that far out. But for a long time, people expected Jalen Harvey to commit to Penn State. And it seems like things are finally going to come to fruition. Yeah, that's the rumor that the pit, uh, the Nittany Lions are the team to beat. And it's kind of interesting because when Penn State was good under Paterno and forever, they always really killed it in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And it was always one of their mainstays. And I don't think it's going to be any different under Franklin. If they're yeah. going to be a consistent top 10 contender, that's a state you got to hit. The per capita in that state is incredible for NFL talent. And this kid's get off and his first step and his ability to change direction is really good. I was surprised at, at his size and how fast he was. He's underrated by some of the services, but I say that a lot. Uh, Penn State would be very fortunate to get Mr. Harvey. Yeah, and Jalen Harvey, uh, according to Rivals, another top 250 player, a four-star, listed at six foot two, 243 pounds. So he already has the ideal weight, a little shorter as an edge defender, but I'm not really going to complain because, as you said, his other intangibles definitely oh, make yeah. up for his physical build. And like Malachi Williams, Penn State isn't really messing around when it comes to recruiting him. They wanted these two defensive ends above all else. We, we've talked about that it's defensive tackle, defensive tackle, defensive tackle. And now Penn State has to focus on the outside rushers. And they got Williams, who's still got to put on a lot of weight. This is some Malachi Williams is someone that is going to have to redshirt unless he's able to do it somehow his senior season, pack on tons of weight. He's listed at 210 uh, currently. But someone who comes in as a six foot two, 240 pound build is already incredible, an incredible start. When you look at the player profile of Chop Robinson, who weighs 255 going into this season. Yeah, that's another kind of deal, man. Uh, they've got a lot of players that can play different spots. I love Malachi, by the way. Yeah. His upside is phenomenal. I think after a redshirt year, Penn State fans are really going to like him. Chop Robinson and some of these other kids that they're bringing in that can move around and play different spots, that's how you win football games. You've got to be versatile. And the D linemen they're getting, they're getting more length. But again, Jalen, I don't really care about the height. Yeah. He's a kid that can make plays from different spots. I think he could play some three technique at some point, whatever you want, but they're going to move these guys around. I, I really like their class. And this is, we're going now, actually, before we get to ties here, Denmark, I do want to make a mention of Jalen Harvey attends Quincy Orchard High School. Very, very talented football team in the state of Maryland. And they get some help. And maybe this is a recruiting pitch or at least something that can help the cause, right? Xavier Gilliam is going to be transferring right. over into Quincy Orchard and will play alongside Jalen Harvey. So maybe they can have a few conversations leading up to the season. Well, that never hurts. I mean, no. kids recruit kids where I live, down here in Florida, it's a big deal. All the time. I literally yeah. watch kids do it like on a seven-on-seven -seven field. I'll be 10 feet away, and they're openly recruiting each other. It's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, just, I'm like, I'm over here, but it, yeah. you know, off the record conversations that happens a lot and more power to them. Hey man, I want to win too. You know, I want good players on my team, so I can't really blame anybody, but you're right. That is a very good high school program. And if you can consistently dip your toes into those waters, it would behoove Penn state to do so. And you know what, if that's another way they can get an advantage, I'm sure that James Franklin and his staff would be really happy with Gilliam for doing that. And James Franklin has said this too, Brian. He says that he and his staff can only do so much. The best recruiters are the players that are in the class, the ones that have bought in, yeah. that are able to continue to sell the program beyond the capability. Because right now, okay, let's think about the dead period, right? In the dead period, James Franklin and the staff can can text. They can send messages. I think they can they can get phone calls, but they can't have official visits. But the players they can go hang out if they want to. I know they're all oh, in different absolutely. geographical re uh, regions, but the players they they have no limits as far as what can be done in terms of selling Penn State as the best football program for those respective prospects. Now, someone that Penn State has been fortunate to flip away from Oregon 
things get a little interesting here. And this isn't a topic that I, that I necessarily want to speak on, and I'm not going to give my opinion on it, but it is something that needs to be reported and said. And Brian, since you are the recruiting expert, I wonder just how these uh, this affects things. Tizer Denmark, it has been reported that he has flunked out of Roman Catholic High School. I don't know where he's going to go in the state of Pennsylvania. I don't know if there's a prep school, if there's something he's going to do in terms of homeschooling. That's not what I'm here to comment on. It's a matter of figuring out how this ultimately leads him to Penn State. In order to get to Penn State, you have to graduate from high school. That is that is an important part of all of this. Brian, is this is this concer concerning in the scheme of things that Denmark currently not enroll and, and Roman Catholic, a very good football team, might I add, a very good high school as well, uh, no longer enrolled there? Does that does that murky the waters a little bit for Denmark's outlook to signing for Penn State? It's one thing to be committed, but we saw it in the past that it, it doesn't always work out for prospects. Can tally. Uh, that was apparently an academic issue. I'm not saying that's going to be Tizier Denmark, but if he wants to get everything situated, uh, it how how concerning is it at the end of the day? I would say it's very concerning because you worry about the young man first. Yeah, I have no idea what's going on in his life. Um, Roman Catholics, a good high school, and I'm sure it's more challenging than just a random school. But at the same time. I, I just wonder what's going on for him not to even be eligible to be in the school anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm guessing there's, there's something going on off the field or whatever, but whatever it may be in these circumstances, most of the time the kids end up in junior college or they go to prep school. Um, I don't know how far along he is or like, you know, how many credits he needs. Right. So beyond that, I can't, I have no idea how to speak to it. He, he's certainly not going to be an early enrollee. I can guarantee you that um, these are kind of, unusual situations nowadays. So need to find out more about off the field, what's going on in his life. And I'm sure James Franklin's trying to figure out, Hey, what's the best path for this kid himself first. Then let's worry about Penn state and, and college football. And, and for ties here, Denmark, at least if we want to look at the bright side of this, let's, let's compare this to Ken Talley because that was just the, that was the rumored result that the academics weren't quite there for him to officially enroll at Penn state. And he ultimately goes to Michigan state and Ken Talley was actually one of the most vocal recruiters for Penn state in that class of 2022. That's besides the point. Tizier Denmark has a lot of time to figure this out. If there is something that, that he's struggling with academically, if he's, if he can fulfill these requirements now rather than it, sneaking up on him right when the deadline is there to yep. sign and enroll. He's got a year's time. He's got his full senior year. So that's the positive look at that. Yeah. He's, he's got a, a full season ahead of him. Now can he make the transition to wherever it is mm -hmm. and get his nose in the books and make sure it gets straightened out. That's really on him as much as anything else. But again, I don't know what circumstances are around him either. So it's easy for me to say. Hopefully it works itself out and rather quickly. And if you're new to the show, Locked on Nittany Lines, wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, subscribe to the show, help support the channel. And we appreciate all the everydayers and become an everydayer by checking out this podcast every single day. Brian, as we move to the final segment, uh, more recruiting news. The last bash is coming up for Penn State, one of the most iconic events when it comes to Penn State's annual schedule for football. Big recruiting event, the final weekend in July. Prospects are going to be on campus. You, there's already some high-profile ones, one of which actually landed a future cast from rivals. That is Michael Carroll, class of 2025. It's never too early. Penn State already has one of the top running back and offensive line commits in that class with respect, right? But then now being able to add an in, it seems like Penn State, this is the formula that they like to do. Go and try to land the best offensive lineman as soon as possible in the state of Pennsylvania. Yep. Javen Williams, a couple years ago. Cooper Cousins in the class of 2024. And now Michael Carroll is supposed to be that headlining offensive line prospect locally. Locally, they're going to continue to branch out and probably get some more offensive linemen. But I think that it seems like that always is the foundation of the, these recent recruiting classes by going and getting the best offensive line prospect in Pennsylvania to start that next cycle. That's a great way to do it, man. And he's from a tradition-rich program. Yeah. Uh, Central Box East, I mean – if you follow football in Pennsylvania, there are some certain schools that, you know, 
And he's from one of them, and he looks like a kid that's going to be a massive interior offensive lineman. He's already 290, give or take. Yeah. And I was watching his film a little bit ago. He could mash people, man. He has a lot of power for a sophomore in high school. Now he's got two more years, and he's already a Penn State-level recruit. So now it's it's really about just technique and getting better. Can't teach the size, though, man. He, he is humongous, and he can move his feet. Now, I wouldn't say he's the most highly touted prospect right now, but again, it's all it's so strange, folks, how Penn State always lands these commitments who are listed as three stars or they're unranked and everyone's saying, okay, Penn State settles. The rankings aren't finite. This is a constant flowing, moving situation. So for someone like Michael Carroll, he's going to commit early because Penn State sees the four-star potentially five-star uh, prospect at the end of the day when he has finished developing as a prospect. Yep. That's part of it too. O-line in particular, I could care no less what a kid is ranked right now if he's a sophomore yeah. in high school. It's it's the longest process by far is O-line. It ain't even close. So if Penn State likes him, I'm good with it. I watched his film too, and it's not that hard to see. But Penn State knows the projections. They know what they're looking for. And they know the people around his program. They're going to ask the off the field quite, you know, academics, mm -hmm. character, work ethic, those things matter too. So I think they're going to be just fine. And, and now there isn't a commitment date set. We don't know exactly when Michael Carroll could hypothetically join the class of 2025 for the Nittany Lions, but the Lash Bash is definitely a potential opportunity, right? If he's going to be on campus for this event, this is kind of that one final push to say, hey, let's get you over the commitment finish line and get you in this class of 2025. Even though it's only three players, Keandre Barker is arguably one of the best running backs in, in the class of 2025. They have Amari Gaines, who's listed as an athlete, according to rivals. And then J-Line Matthews, who out of, out of the state of New Jersey, started taking some additional visits from the, you know, the likes of Georgia, Alabama, Florida, getting involved as well. Uh, but that is that that is that headline. Those two headliner prospects right there, Matthews and Barker right out of the gate. And then to add Carroll on top of this, I mean, Penn State right now, it, I know the class of 2025 isn't as exciting, but according to rivals, they're number three in the rankings as we speak. I'm not really surprised. This is what Penn State has done for a very long time. You got to recruit your backyard first. New Jersey is just an extension of Pennsylvania and yeah. culture, and the football is just as good. So why not recruit it? Penn State has always done really well in New Jersey. I, and no offense to Rutgers, but they're not going to be Penn State for many recruits. No, they might as well go after the top kids. They stand out. The top 10 kids in New Jersey can play in any state, no problem, in a year. So that's a really good start for them, and it helps them before they come where I am down in Florida and try to cherry pick in the South. Good job for Penn State. And it shows what Phil Troutwine is continuing to do, leading the offensive line group since he's taken over as the position coach. They they just win after win after win when it comes to recruiting battles. Sure, you're not going to get every single football prospect on the offensive line, but when you dominate the state, and then you start to branch out and you get those prospects like an Alex Birchmeyer. We're seeing a Garrett Sexton involved into the uh, evolve into this top of the line prospect when once upon a time, a low rank three star, right? So Michael Carroll, I think, is going to have that same trajectory. And Penn State, once again, just getting in early access when it comes to evaluating the talent before they blow up and then all the schools are in. And that's how you build the relationships. You have to start, you have to be there first. You have to show up first and, and show the attention uh, and, and be genuine about it. And it seems like Penn state's really doing that uh, in 2024, 25 and on honestly beyond 26 could be a really good class too. But Brian, as always, I appreciate the time enjoy the perspective right these are fun conversations and this should be a really good week when all is said and done for penn state recruiting absolutely i look forward to seeing what happens and uh, i'll talk to you again soon my friend thanks again for checking out this episode of locked on nittany lions part of the locked on podcast network where it is your team every single day if you like what we do here on the show follow along on twitter at locked on nittany you can follow my personal account at Zach underscore Seiko. And if you haven't already, become an everydayer, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and to the YouTube channel.